right now, though, is how we got here. I want to talk about why I founded AppNexus. Now, my suspicion is that not many of you were in San Francisco in 2010 when we had our very first AppNexus Summit. Anybody here actually at the first ever AppNexus Summit? Marco. That's right, that's where we met. So, very low percentage chance that you've heard me say this before. So, I started AppNexus because after we sold Right Media to Yahoo, I retired. I went to the beach, I went to Spain, I went to Morocco, I went to Cuba, I was very, very happy. But every time I would return to the States, my phone would ring and someone would ask me, hey, I'm using Right Media and there's this one thing I want to do and I can't quite figure out how to do it. And I kept saying, sorry, you can't do it. It's a closed platform. It just can't do what you want it to do. And after a number of these calls, the entrepreneur in me said, you know what? Maybe I should go figure out how to start a business that can allow people to do anything they can think of. So if nothing else, they'll stop calling me while I'm on vacation. And that truly was the beginning of AppNexus. Now my first idea was, let's build a cloud computing platform that would allow anyone with an idea to build their software right next to all of the supply we could bring in so they could do whatever they wanted to. And that was where RTB came from. The idea that in real time, we'd send bid requests to every one of these bidders and that they would respond with some kind of algorithmically determined bid. And that worked out really well in one sense, which is that we have lots of bidders out there. But the real problem with this was our idea that all of these bidders would reside in our cloud, that AppNexus would be the nexus where all of these different interesting applications would sit. And the reason that nexus was so important was because it's technically impossible, more or less, to get different technologies to communicate in real time across the long distances of different data centers. And so you say, well, hey, Brian, this industry works pretty well. But if you actually look at this chart, we actually have a chart of the timeout rates that we see across every bidder on the system. And what you see is this is at the bottom would be zero, no timeouts, and the top is 100%. I feel pretty sorry for whoever's up there with the 95% timeout rate of that bidder. I don't even know who it is, so I'm not naming names. Um, but you see a pretty high distribution of all these bidders that we work with. We probably work with more than anyone else in the industry. You see an extraordinary number of timeouts. And this isn't including error rates, which are also very high. What this means is that for every impression that comes into the platform, there's a relatively low probability, like zero, that every single bidder is bidding. And that means that if you're using any of these bidder technologies, you're missing out on huge amounts of traffic. And if you're a publisher or you're working with publishers, it means that you're not getting the full bid density. These campaigns, these branding opportunities just aren't happening for you. And so this, to me, proves that RTB isn't working as a way to really open up our space. In other words, you can, it's possible to go build a bidder, but it's very, very technically difficult. Now, some of you are probably thinking, hey, but there's companies out there that I can pay money to to stop me from seeing all the traffic so I don't time out as much. Let's think about that again. You can pay them not to send you traffic. Now that might be the best business model I've heard in a long while. If any of you want to pay us not to send you traffic, please grab me outside. We'll figure out a fair rate for not doing something. So that's obviously not a good solution. And by the way, not sending traffic still doesn't allow you to bid on it and monetize it. So it makes it cheaper, maybe, but it really doesn't solve the problem. One interesting fact for those of you who actually have gone down the path of building bidders is that it's very expensive to actually build a bidder. We did a straw poll of a number of our clients and partners who either built or tried to build bidders. And the number we kept coming back to was around $5 million a year to build, maintain, support, and host a bidder. That's crazy. And this is to make one that actually works. Obviously, there's ways to do this cheaper. But if you're going to spend $5 million a year before you write one line of interesting code that actually does things that everybody else can't do, then you, know, you have very deep pockets, and we should also talk after this. But my personal opinion is that it shouldn't cost $5 million to run an algorithm in real time, or this whole exchange thing just isn't going to work. So there must be a better way. And I've been thinking about this for a very long time. What would that better way be? 
At Write Media, I had the idea that our clients could compile their own algorithms, ship us the files, we'd run them in real time, and then you know, we, could, we could make everything work. Um, we tried that exactly once with a startup called RevCube in San Francisco. They shipped us a library, we tested it, we deployed it to production, and every single server crashed. So if you were working with Write Media that day, I think it took us about two hours to get everything back up. It was called an outage. So we never tried it again. Um, at AppNexus, we've played with different mechanisms to do this. We keep coming back to the same problem. How can you isolate different clients' algorithms from each other's so they don't crash the whole system? How do you deal with security? How do you deal with memory? How do you deal with CPU? All of these technical problems kept coming in the way, and so we could never find a way to make this work. And so one day, a few months ago, I was in the office, and I was sort of complaining, as I often do, about why can't we figure this out, you know? And all of a sudden, I bumped into Dr. Paul Kwong, who's one of our most amazing technologists. And Paul said, Brian, why don't we just use wavelet trees? Now, I consider myself to be a reasonably good computer scientist and a pretty smart guy, and so I nodded my head, as I do when anyone says something I don't know. I said, yeah, absolutely. Great idea. Let me think about that for a while. And I ran back to my desk, looked it up on Wikipedia, read the whole Wikipedia article, which I encourage you to do. I still had no idea what he was talking about. So I went back to his desk, tail between my legs, and said, Paul, could you explain it for someone who's not quite as smart as you? And what he explained to me, I mean, trees, I get it, but how does that solve the problem? And what he said was, look, the problem is, if you let people run arbitrary programming languages, then they can do almost anything, including crash all your servers. What you need to do is give them a programming language that compiles down to a decision tree. If you look at this next slide, you'll see an example. So a decision tree is a pretty simple thing to understand. You know, a user, is this user in a certain segment? If so, go right. If not, go left. So if you're in this segment and you're at the guardian.com and it's between 9 and, and 4 PM, then you know, we're going to bid you know, 0.83 pounds. And you can see how this plays out. So this is a decision tree. And you can express an enormous amount with these trees, because almost anything can be represented as a series of these decisions. So what we did was we built a programming language. We call it Bonsai. Get it? Little trees. And this programming language represents this exact tree. We've tried this now in production. We actually wrote a, a Bonsai program, or a decision tree, for one of our clients, and we actually put this in production last week. It was about 3,000 lines long and had incredibly complex logic. Some of those lines were you know, thousands of characters long, saying things like if domain in a huge list of 1,000 different domains and you know, a certain time and a certain segment and a certain supply type, you know, go on and on and on. And we actually deployed that into production, so completely customizable logic that tells our system what to do. So we've taken this idea of bidding out of the realm of building bidders and moved it into writing simple programming languages. And I'll tell you what, you don't need a whole bunch of servers to write a programming language. So the way it works is, as a buyer, you pass your algorithm into the platform. You probably already have your data on our platform. I think we're the, one of the only, if not the only, company that has real-time data hooks. So you can actually pass data in real time or using segments. Of course, we have real-time trafficking, and we have real-time reporting, which we announced here last year, our Pulse system. So we have real-time everything going on here. You set up your campaigns, and then we can stream all the data back out. This is a new feature we announced yesterday at our Optimize conference, real-time streaming logs. So we can actually stream logs to you, so you can build real-time algorithms, push them in, we'll run them real-time. Basically, I'm trying to make the point, it's all real-time, and it's all really pretty amazing, and this, in the middle is where we execute your algorithm. So in every one of the 120 billion impressions we see every day, we're going to execute your little program. And we can execute these by the hundreds of thousands. Today we have about 1.4 million campaigns live on the system and active. And we can put these trees into all of them because they're that fast to execute. And at least so far, you know, knock on wood, we haven't crashed the whole internet yet. And we've been doing this live for a week. So what we call this is the AppNexus Programmable Bidder, meaning that you can program our bidder to do whatever you can think of. You can innovate, you can be creative, you can do all the things you do now, but you don't have to spend millions of dollars to build a bidder. 
You don't have to license something to not see bids. And most importantly, you bid on every single impression. There's no timeouts. If you did that graph, the timeout graph with our bidder, you'd have to use a microscope to actually see our timeout rate. It's well below 1%. It's so small that you actually don't time out. And, and this means you're getting to bid on more impressions. You also take full benefit of our cookie match. We actually have very high overlap with every audience out there. So it means you don't have to worry about you know, how many of your users actually are found on different platforms. Of course, you also have a user interface that you get for free as part of our platform. You have a user experience team. You have reporting. You have every feature that our platform has, and you still get to build your own secret sauce. Because that's what it's all about. You heard Michael talk about it. If you aren't differentiating, then you don't matter. And if you're not focusing your effort on that differentiation, you're wasting your money, and you're wasting your time. And we're at a moment in this industry where none of us has time or money to waste. So my advice to you, go back to your offices, ask your team, what could we do if we didn't have to worry about the cost and complexity of building a bidder? And we could just go build algorithms to make media do amazing things. AppNexus Programmable Bidder. We'll have this alpha now. We'll have it out soon for all of you. Really hope to see next year in London all of the interesting things that you've done with this. And I look forward also to our next Optimize event in New York in November, where we'll pull our entire developer community together again. Thank you.